This week's Dark Side of the Ring covered the late Terry Gordy. The final flight of the Freebird is what they called this episode. Uh, and one of the greatest big men in the history of the business who probably does not get talked about enough. Uh, you know, he's something of a forgotten figure in today's wrestling world. People know him as part of the fabulous Freebirds. But it was really the tale of two careers with Gordy. You know, one with the Freebirds and then another in Japan. And as part of a tag team with the late Dr. Death Steve Williams. But he was only 32 when he overdosed and suffered permanent brain damage that cut his career short. I mean, he still wrestled after that, but he was never the same. And he was only 40 years old when he passed away in 2001. Uh, I thought the episode did a good job of balancing Terry Gordy the talent and Terry Gordy the family man with Terry Gordy the party animal who did things to excess. As a lot of people did in the wrestling business back then. Maybe Gordy more than most. And unfortunately, a lot of those people are no longer around anymore to talk about it. But in the end, it cost him everything. Uh, not exactly a story we haven't heard before in this series, but Gordy does not come across as a bully or as someone who abused people or had a lot of enemies. He was his own worst enemy. He and Michael Hayes were inseparable. They, they weren't just tag team partners, they were like brothers. And Michael, being a part of WWE, was obviously not going to be interviewed for this, but he did tweet that he watched the episode and he was pleased with how accurate it was. Uh, Shane Helms would have a different opinion of the Buff Bagwell episode. But if anybody knew Gordy, it was Michael Hayes. And if he says the episode was accurate, or mostly accurate, then it must be pretty damn accurate. Uh, Hayes' absence was noticeable here, though, because, like I said, nobody was closer with Gordy than he was. And he could have added insight to this that was missing. But as talking heads go, they had two of Gordy's kids, his son Ray, who played Jesse of Jesse and Festus fame on SmackDown many years ago, and his daughter Miranda, who is also a wrestler. She wrestles independently. He has another daughter, Amber, who was never mentioned. They spoke with his nephew, Richard, who also was a wrestler. They spoke with Jimmy Garvin, who became part, officially part of the fabulous Freebirds. I think it was in 89. I know it was in the late 80s that he officially joined with them, although I know before that, when Gordy was, was over in Japan, he would come back and forth, Garvin would fill in for him, but he became an official member of the Freebirds uh, later on. But it's Mick Foley and Jim Cornette who I thought shined the most and really added to the episode. Uh, if you were looking for anything about his upbringing, they gave us next to nothing. Uh, I can tell you he got his start early, and when I say early, he had his first wrestling match at 13 years old. By 18, he was headlining at the Superdome. I always thought Rey Mysterio started earlier than, than almost anyone, but Gordy got him beat. He dropped out of school in the ninth grade to become a wrestler. It's all he ever wanted to do. And he had a natural gift for it. Everybody in the episode spoke glowingly about his ability. You could see it just by watching his matches. Pretty early into the episode, they were already talking about Terry meeting Michael Hayes for the first time in Mississippi. And Michael was a fan of Leonard Skinner, as a lot of people were back then, and he was the one who pitched the idea of calling their team the Freebirds, and they started coming out to the song, which Cornette said was not a common thing at the time to have entrance music, and it wasn't. They, they were the first to really popularize it. Now, in the past, you know, Sergeant Slaughter has claimed that he used to come out, which he did, he used to come out to the Marine Corps hymn in the 70s, so different people at different times have sort of taken credit for ushering in the era of entrance music and wrestling, but Gorgeous George was coming out to pomp and circumstance back in the 50s. So George would have them all beat, and he may not have even been the first to do it. I think there was, there was somebody else before him. So it goes back a lot longer than uh, just the Freebirds. Buddy Roberts was later added to make the Freebirds a trio. And they quickly glossed over their legendary feud with the Von Erichs in World Class. And they had comments from Kevin Von Erich in the episode and David Manning, who was the booker and the promoter and the referee, or a referee, in World Class. They said the promotion caught fire with the Birds and the Von Erichs feud, and it did. And it all stemmed from one of the most famous angles in wrestling history, and they never even mentioned it. So I will. It was their Christmas Star Wars show in 1982, Watching the episode, you would never know that when the Freebirds came into World Class, they were babyfaces. Because they just sort of mentioned them, this great feud they had with the Von Erichs. The Von Erichs were the heroes, and the Freebirds were the evil heels. But when they first came in, 
to the territory, uh, they were baby faces. That way the heel turn would mean more when it eventually came. And on Christmas night, 1982, they were supposed to team with Buddy Roberts to challenge for the inaugural six-man tag team titles. When Buddy couldn't make it, David Von Erich took his place as a substitute. They won the titles, and then David graciously surrendered his title for Buddy to take when he got there. But then later that same night is when Kerry wrestled Ric Flair in a cage for the NWA World Heavyweight title. Michael Hayes was the guest uh, enforcer, the guest referee. They chose him because Flair had a reputation for winning his matches with some uh, controversial means. And they knew that Hayes wouldn't take crap from anybody. So he was the special referee. When Flair and Kerry both got knocked out, Hayes put Kerry on top of Rick for the three count. But Kerry didn't want to win the title that way. And so the two of them argued and Hayes went to go leave. Flair shoves Kerry into Hayes, knocks him out of the cage. When Hayes turns around, he only sees Kerry. And he didn't know that it was Ric Flair who caused the shove. And that's when Terry Gordy on the outside slams the cage door on Kerry's head. And that's what ignited the feud between the Freebirds and the Von Erichs that set the entire territory on fire. You know, on the Tales from the Territories episode that they did on World Class... They talked about Gordy slamming the cage door on Kerry's head so hard that it left an indent in his skull, which is why Kerry was bleeding so much. If you ever watch the actual footage of what happened, you can clearly see Kerry blading himself. <laughs> I mean, the other story is cool. It makes Gordy sound more badass, I guess, but that's not exactly what happened. So they very briefly mentioned the Freebirds' time in WWE. And the reason that it was briefly mentioned is because it was a very brief run and there really wasn't much to talk about. Uh, Jimmy Garvin said that Terry was hungover and fell asleep in a meeting with Vince McMahon, which did not go over very well. And then they flamed out quickly. And that was really the extent of it. And they had a little bit of footage from one of their WWF matches. I think it might have been from the Philadelphia Spectrum. But that was the extent to which they, they covered it. And by the way, that is a true story. According to Michael Hayes, he did... Uh, doze off in a meeting with Vince McMahon. I don't know that it was their first meeting, but he did, uh, as he says, he took a nap. Uh, Maybe it wasn't the right time. He goes, everybody takes a nap. Maybe that was the wrong time to do it. So that that is true. But there is also a very long-told story that Andre the Giant got the Freebirds fired. Andre did not get the Freebirds fired. And what happened, in, in the words of Michael Hayes himself, because he's told this story before, is that Vince McMahon wanted him. He did not necessarily want Buddy Roberts or Terry Gordy, even though they did come in with him. But Vince really wanted Michael. Plus, Hayes says Terry met the love of his life, and, and Gordy didn't really want to leave Texas. So his heart wasn't really into going to New York in the first place. One night, they show up, they're outside some high school, and and I, <laughs> this story, you're talking about 1980s wrestling, this story could go a lot of bad ways. But no, they, they, they were in front of a high school because there was a show there that night. Michael says, why are we here? They're like, well, we, we're working tonight. And this was news to Michael because he thought they had the night off. So he had been drinking, he had been taking pills. Now they're telling him we got to work. Well, it just so happens that Andre was working as the agent for the show that night. And they walk in, and Andre's in the back. He's playing cards. Andre looks up, and he points at Michael Hayes, and he goes, He's drunk. And Buddy and Terry, they try to stick up for their friend. They're like, No, he's not. As soon as they let go of him, Hayes falls down drunk on the floor. So Andre is upset because, you know, he put a good word in for these guys to get them the gig in the first place. And as it turned out, Andre never did stooge him off to management. He never did call in and say, hey, you know, this guy was drunk. You should get rid of him. Hayes says he called Vince McMahon himself and stooged himself off over what happened. Maybe he thought that, you know, he would beat them to the punch. I don't know. But he called Vince and told him what happened and, you know, apologized for it. Even then, he wasn't fired. Uh, He was fired later on. They were on their way to Japan. They were literally, they were leaving for a flight to Japan. They had a booking there that Vince knew about when he first brought them in. And they had that commitment. They were about to fly out. 
And he got a call from George Scott, who was booking for Vince at the time. And George Scott is the one who told him, look, Vince, he doesn't trust you. He doesn't think he can rely on you, so he's letting you go. And that was the end of the Freebirds in WWE. They lasted all of five months. Uh, Gordy, after this, made his way over to Japan for the first time. He became the next... And when I say the first time, this is when he really started to catch fire as a, a singles heel over there. He, he became the next American monster uh, in the same vein of a Bruiser Brody or a Stan Hansen. And he had great success working there. The problem is it took a toll on him physically. You know, the travel, uh, that harder style. And Cornette said that Gordy, he tore both of his ACLs, kept on working. Eventually, he had to get double knee surgery, and he was told by his doctor, look, you got to lose weight, because he was a big guy. He was over 300 pounds, and so he reached out to Richard Simmons, and he was able to slim down to 265 pounds. Terry Gordy contacting Richard Simmons is not the turn of events that I was expecting. (laughs) Wow. Wow. How about Richard Simmons managing Terry Gordy? Holy shit, that would have been amazing. Nice little heel duo. Richard Simmons comes out, he'd get easy heat. God, imagine him managing Terry Gordy. So Gordy became the first American to win the All Japan Triple Crown. They talked about his 1991 match with Mitsuharu Misawa, which may be the greatest singles match of his career. Uh, It's hard for me to say because I don't have the familiarity with his work, especially his singles work, that other people might who are either a little bit older than I am, or maybe they were watching World Class and they were watching the NWA, they were watching these different places uh, that that he landed, maybe they were tape trading you know, for, for Japanese stuff, I wasn't doing any of that. It's hard for me to sit here and say, here are the top five or top ten Terry Gordy matches. Uh, from what I have seen of him, it would be the wars that the Freebirds had with the Von Erichs, and it would be some of those tag team matches that he and Dr. Death had later on. You know, they got put together as a team. The Miracle Violence Connection, which is an awesome name, by the way. And at one point in 1992, they held the WCW and the NWA tag team titles at the same time. Uh, he was making more money than he ever did before in his career during that period. He was pulling in around 200 grand a year with WCW, and then he would work something like two dozen weeks out of the year in Japan for Giant Baba, making 10 grand a week. So he was doing real well, but he was also a big partier. Lots of booze, lots of drugs. Where pills entered the picture, nobody knows exactly, but they believe it may have started with his trips to Japan. He would fly into Japan two days before a tour. Whenever he was booked, he would take pills to knock himself out for the flight over, and he would end up spending that first day sleeping it off in his hotel room. So by the time the tour started, you know, the next day, it was all out of his system, he was all rested, and he was all ready to go to work. He was actually supposed to work Hulk Hogan in the main event of a uh, joint Tokyo Dome show. It was WWE, it was New Japan, it was All Japan. This, this, was a, this was a big show that was held back in 1990. It was the same show where Bret Hart wrestled uh, Misawa when Misawa was Tiger Mask 2. But this was like a week after WrestleMania 6. It was supposed to be Hogan and Gordy in the main event. Gordy backed out of the match at the last minute. Uh, he didn't want to do the job for Hogan. So Stan Hansen took his place instead. So we were deprived of what would have been the one and only Hulk Hogan-Terry Gordy match. Uh, that would have happened. And, you know, I think back to uh, Gordy in the mid to late 80s, and you look at some of that stuff he was doing in Japan, I said it was more in the vein of a Bruiser Brody or a Stan Hansen. And people have said before, you know, would Brody have eventually gone to WWE? Would he have eventually gone there and, and gotten paid and had a feud with Hogan and did the job for the big leg? We'll never know. Uh, I think Hogan and Brody could have been an amazing program. But I wonder if Gordy, you know, you think back to that, if if Gordy against Hogan would have been a money-making program. I don't know, Gordy, I don't know if Gordy is the kind of person that Vince McMahon would have had any interest in pushing. I I guess not, since originally he brought in the Freebirds and really just had plans for Michael Hayes, not so much the rest of them. But I think that if Gordy would have come in as this monster ass-kicker, yeah, you could have built up somebody like him for a feud with Hogan in uh, 88, 
89. I think that could I think that could have made them some money. But anyway, three months later, right? They have this joint show at the Tokyo Dome. Gordy pulls out, but he's on top of the world. He's making good money, right? He's he's got all these tag team titles. Three months later, came his first drug overdose. He and Doc, they were out one night in Rapungi. Gordy was taking Halcyon pills. He collapses. And they had footage from an old Dr. Death shoot interview where he was describing you know, he's doing CPR on him until the ambulance came to take him to the hospital. When Gordy woke up, he didn't remember anything. He did not remember anything that happened. And then on August 18th, 1993, came the second overdose, which almost killed him, and it forever changed his life. Terry Gordy, the wrestling prodigy, died on that trip. First, he had so many pills in his system, Doc had to wheel him through the airport in a wheelchair just to get him on the plane. He gets on the plane. He swallows 50 somas, which are muscle relaxers. Okay, 50 of them. And they're about 30 minutes from landing in Japan. Doc looks over. He sees Terry. He's turning blue. He's sucking air like he, he was about to swallow his tongue. And he said in the past when he gets like this, he would smack him across the face a few times to kind of wake him up and snap him out of it. So that's what he did here. He tried slapping him a few times across the face. Usually it worked. This time it didn't work. And he knew that he was dying. And as soon as they landed, because they were 30 minutes away from landing in Japan, as soon as they land, uh, the ambulance was already there. They rushed him to the hospital. He was in a coma for two days. And he survived. He came out of it, but he was never the same. You know, he had lost a lot of his motor skills. He was very slow to react. Uh, He suffered permanent damage. You know, he suffered brain damage. And he had to relearn how to do a lot of things, including how to wrestle. If you look at him, and they had footage of him at different shows, you know, post-overdose, there's just this look in his eye. You know what it reminds me of, in a way, when I'm looking at Gordy in some of these images? It reminds me of, of Perk Angle. From TNA. Perk Angle gets talked about a lot. He he was a wrestling machine. But you would look at him and he had this glassy, faraway stare in his eyes. Like, the lights are on, but nobody's home. This guy is out to lunch and we don't know when he's coming back. But yet he would go out there and he would perform. He never missed a beat. The man was a machine. But it was scary. You know, I got to meet Kurt at one of the TNA shows. They came to Webster Hall in New York, and I got to, to be in the ring with him, and I'm looking at him, and I look at the photo sometimes. He took a Polaroid that night, and it's just, again, he had that look in his eyes. It was scary. And that's kind of the vibe I get when I look at these images post-overdose of Terry Gordy. There's just this lifelessness to that stare. Like, whatever life was there behind his eyes before was just wiped out. Cornette got very emotional. I think only the second time I can remember him getting this emotional in one of these episodes, the other one being the Owen Hart one. Uh, When he heard that Gordy was doing independent shows again, he thought to himself, man, if this guy is anything close to what he used to be, we got to get him here in Smoky Mountain. And they brought Gordy in, and he just wasn't the same. He couldn't do a promo anymore like he used to. And they all kept hoping that Over time, maybe it'll all come back to him, and it just never did. And he told this one story. He goes, he'd be standing around, Cornette would be. And he remembers one day, he he just kind of turned around, and it's like he was spooked because Terry was standing right behind him. And he asked him, you know, Terry, do do you need anything? And he goes, Jim, I I was just wondering if you want me to do the powerbomb. And he was like, well, yes, Terry, if if you want to do the powerbomb, you can do the powerbomb. It's just he wasn't the same person. You know, he looked the same, he had the same frame, he was doing the same moves, he would do the power bomb, and he just kind of going through the motions, but there was no life to it. And they talked to Mick Foley, who wrestled Terry uh, in an IWA King of the Death match, and they had this hardcore match with all kinds of uh, weapons and stuff. It was a tournament, and they wrestled in the first round. And Foley said that Gordy had some of the best punches in wrestling. He had one of the best work punches in the business, but it was obvious that his his punches were not there anymore. And he was concerned for him, like out of respect for him, he didn't want him to go out there and embarrass himself. And he told he told Terry, he goes, look, Terry, 
when we go out there, like you just you gotta bring those punches, like <laughs> like bring them legit. And he says to his credit, Terry didn't have to be told twice, and he went out there and. Yeah, they had what Mick thought was a pretty good match, and he thought maybe, you know, maybe we had just turned back the hands of time a little bit, but it just wasn't meant to be. And his daughter said that Terry continued to wrestle after the accident because it's all he ever knew how to do. I I told you before, he dropped out of school in the ninth grade. You know, he didn't have a degree. He didn't have any other skills that he had applied to other jobs early in his life. He didn't know how to do anything else. This is all he ever knew. And he popped up in ECW. I, I believe he wrestled Raven during that time at ECW. And uh, they had what people thought was a very good match, which I think Raven subsequently said was, you know, <laughs> it was kind of all smoke and mirrors. And, he you know, he did what he could. But, again, there just wasn't much to, to work with there. Now, they had footage, and this is one of the saddest parts of the entire episode. They had footage of an interview that I did not even know existed. Terry sat down... Uh, Not long before his death, it was only a few years before his death, it was in 1998, he sat down for a shoot interview with RF Video. And his daughter was very upset when she first saw the interview because, you you know, you could hear Rob Feinstein in the background just hounding this guy with questions. And it pissed her off because she just wanted him to, to leave her father alone. He doesn't have anything to say, you know, Feinstein's trying to get stuff out of him, and can you talk about this and that story, and what was it like to work here and work with this person, and you could see he's struggling to come up with with the words or the memories because he probably just doesn't remember, and he's giving these very basic answers uh, without any kind of details to it. It It was very depressing to see. It was very depressing to see, and a lot of his answers were, you know, I don't remember... Uh, you know, this guy, oh, he was a good guy. He apologized at one point, just randomly apologized. They're like, for what? And he goes, well, you know, for the overdose. And, you know, basically because he couldn't remember anything. So he felt like he had to apologize to people. And there were, there were people who were upset because after he passed away in 01, uh, I think, I think our video re-released the interview and, you know, people thought that he was exploiting his death. I think Feinstein's argument was, no, 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 we're, you know, celebrating his life. It's like, yeah, okay. But it's just sad to watch. It's sad to see. And they talked about his run in WWE, which came two years before he sat down for that interview. Uh, In 96, they brought him in as the executioner. And this I remember. They brought him in under a hood with Paul Bear and Mankind. As the executioner. And his daughter was actually glad they put him under a hood. Because she saw it as a sign of respect. They didn't want to put Gordy out there as himself. They didn't want to put him out there as Terry Gordy. When he could not be Terry Gordy anymore. So they kind of hid him away. It was pretty obvious if you knew who he was. It wasn't like you can't. You look. You could clearly see through the mask who it is. But to the general audience. Again there was never any mention of Gordy. There was nothing. He was just the executioner. That's what he was. Michael Hayes, I think, in the tweet that he posted when he talked about the episode being fairly accurate, he did say there was one thing that wasn't. And I'm not, I'm still not quite clear on exactly what he was saying. What I got out of the tweet was, in the episode, they, they inferred that Hayes got his friend a job in WWE. It seems like in the tweet he's disputing that and saying that that wasn't the case or that he had no knowledge of them bringing him in, I find that very hard to believe. I mean, they were not going to give this guy a job randomly. I'm sure Hayes probably put the word in for him and they got he got his friend a job and there's nothing wrong with that. But I would be surprised if Michael Hayes didn't have anything to do with them out of nowhere, you know, bringing in Terry Gordy and giving him a job in WWE. But they showed some footage from the match he had at one of the In Your House pay-per-views against The Undertaker, um, and it was Undertaker, according to Cornette, it was Undertaker who said, uh, look, this is just isn't going to work. You know, he made the call like we're trying here, but this just is not going to work. They all, they all love the guy, but he just couldn't do it anymore. Mick Foley mentioned a story of Terry, uh, talking to a woman on a plane and he would sit down on the plane and total stranger next to him. This woman pills out, uh, pills out, pulls out some pills <laughs> She pills out on the plate. She pulls out some pills, 
Say that ten times fast. And Terry just looks over, has no knowledge of what the pills are, what they do. And he just says to the woman, like, got any extras? And he would just take random pills without even knowing what they were for. You know, he would go from coherent one second to completely under the influence within a matter of minutes. And there were times on the road during that WWE run, and this is part of what led to the end of that run, where he and Paul Bearer would have to track Terry down. They couldn't find him in his hotel room, and they they had to go out and search for him and call out his name to try to find where he was. And he said, this this just wasn't going to work. This could not be a long-term thing. And his run came to an end. So he ended up back on the independent scene in Georgia and Tennessee. And his daughter said that those shows were always very sad. And Mick said he saw Terry at one of those shows. Nobody was going into the ring after the show was over to get his photo or his autograph. Mick was signing and he felt guilty because everybody was waiting in line to see Mick Foley and nobody was waiting for Terry Gordy. And he said he just felt like he wanted to yell at them and say, look, that's a legend in the ring. Why are you with me? You should want to see him instead. It's the one good thing, though, about the last few years of his life is that he was home more often. So his son says that he got to see his dad more than he ever got to see him in his entire life. Uh, They became best friends. They would do things together. And he got to know his dad in a way that, you know, previously he never did. So he was grateful to have that time with him. And Terry was going to be doing an independent show. He had asked his son to be his tag team partner one night. And Ray said he couldn't go, and it was the next day when he got the phone call from uh, Richard, who was uh, Gordy's nephew, who told him, look, get on your knees and start praying because your dad stopped breathing. And Terry was found, he was unresponsive in his home, it was uh, the night after a show, they were doing CPR, Richard tried slapping him in the face like Doc used to because he thought maybe this will work, but he was already gone. And that was on July 16th, 2001. Terry died from congestive heart failure due to a blood clot at the age of 40. Six days before that, so not even a week before he passed away, he was backstage visiting at a SmackDown taping. And he was visiting with Michael Hayes and Jim Ross and Gerald Briscoe was there and seeing all the all the stars. And he seemed to be as clear-headed as anybody could ever remembered him being since the overdose. He seemed to be in a good place. He Again, he was coherent and he was having conversations with people. And this was only six days before he died. But you know how in a lot of these other episodes or when people pass away, legends pass away, you hear me often, unfortunately, talk about how nobody came to the funeral or two people came to the funeral. Well, he had more than 300 people who attended his funeral. He, he was... The polar opposite of all those other stories you've heard me talk about, about Mean Gene and Sherry and these different people who passed away, he had a few hundred people who showed up to pay respects to him after he passed away. And so when the episode was over, obviously it was a sad ending. Now, very similar to the John Tenta episode in that way. I mean, the differences here were pretty glaring in that they talked about how much this guy partied and he did a lot of things that he shouldn't have been doing and ultimately it led to the problems that he had. That wasn't the case with Tenta, but Tenta, you know, the sense you got from everybody is he was a nice guy, great to be around, great to work with. He got dealt a bad hand at the end of his life. He got sick and he passed away far too soon. In the case of Gordy, Again, a lot of it was self-inflicted. The abuse he put himself through with that style when he was in Japan, the traveling back and forth, the injuries, and then the pills. And it all added up, unfortunately, and it, it really did him in at an early age. But everybody loved Terry. Nobody had a bad word to say about him. You know, they, they considered him a friend. He was a nice guy, super talented, and cut short. You know, his life and career cut short far too soon. Uh, so that's kind of the the story of Terry Gordy there. But somebody who had, for the time he was in wrestling and he was on his A-game, he worked everywhere there was to work. He was in all the big regional territories of the 70s and the 80s. Obviously, I mentioned the world-class stuff. He was in Mid-South, briefly in WWE, had a little cup of coffee there. Uh, but he worked WCW, ECW, became a big name in Japan. He worked everywhere. And he was part of one of the most famous groups in the history of the business, he held multiple championships. 
And he'll go down as one in a very long line of what if stories. What if, right? What if he didn't have that overdose? What if he got his act together? What if he got a proper run in a place like WWE? How big could he have become? Unfortunately, we'll never know the answer to that question.